Martin Luther King Lecture 2020. Thank you all for joining us tonight on this special event on the International Human Rights Day. Today we are celebrating different things, but more we're putting the focus on human rights and we're doing this in a very special setting. As you all may know, dear guests, dear all, 2020 has been a year which has given us a lot to think about. It has been an eventful and an impactful year for many different reasons, of which one is the reason why we don't have you here with us. You're watching this from your laptop, maybe you've, you've, you're looking at it from your computer or even your video phone, but whatever it is, we are welcoming you and we're so happy to have you. So what do we have today? You cannot walk alone. We cannot walk alone. It's the theme of this year's event. And we're doing this with a very special programming. Among others, all the way from the USA, we will be having a keynote by Dr. Wes Bellamy. This will be followed by a very dynamic and interactive Q&A, which is something that you will be seeing later. Afterwards, we will be taking you into the world of spoken word where different participants of our spoken word contest will be taking you with them into the word of how they see that we cannot walk alone. Last but not least, we will be finalizing our event with a special spoken word by Alton Kina. However, no event can be a very good event without an opening. And that is why I would like to ask you for your attention. We have Dave Ensberg Kleigerns. Dave will be opening, and you'll be hearing him in a bit, but before you hear this man, I need to tell you who he is. Fasten your seatbelts because the list is about to come. So Dave is a chairperson. He is the chairperson of the Martin Luther King Lecture Foundation. He's the one who, among others, is present here to be giving you a very nice and good presentation. He also serves as a director of Jantje Beton, which is a nonprofit organization in the Netherlands, which focuses on making sure that children have the possibility to get access to play and also to have facilities to play with. So Dave is not only there active, but in many other social causes. We know him as the vice chairman of the Johan Ferrier Fund Foundation, which focuses on supporting projects in Suriname. And this happens in the field of education and culture. But also is he a board member of Maatschappelijke Alliantie, and he is an author of the book Bezielde Beschaving, which was published in 2017. Please, a round of applause for Dave. Thank you very much. What kind of words. Um, I'll be doing this in Dutch as well. Um, beste kijkers, van harte welkom namens de stichting Martin Luther King Lezing voor deze prachtige lezing van vanavond hier in, uh, in Den Haag, maar vooral online. Um, and, and for our English speaking audience, a warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Dave Ensberg Kleikers, and I'm the chair of the Martin Luther King Lecture Foundation in the Netherlands. And although I'll be speaking in, the, in Dutch, uh, you are all very, very welcome. Um, and I hope to see you all next year as well. This year online, and the Q&A will be in, uh, in English. The uh, keynote speech will be in English, but I'll do my part in uh, my mother tongue, uh, Dutch. Yeah, thank you that you have chosen for. Uh, 
het intunen op deze prachtige lezing van, uh, van dit jaar, uitgesproken vooral door uh, Dr. Wes Bellamy, waarover zometeen meer. En het is een bijzondere dag vandaag waarop we deze lezing uh, organiseren. 10 december, de internationale dag voor de mensenrechten. Geen betere dag om burgerrechtenactivisten, geen betere dag om het mensenrechten geloof te prediken en te waarborgen en te vieren. Vandaag is de dag waarop we alle nieuwe Martin Luther King jongens en meisjes in ons koninkrijk, in de hele wereld, de gelegenheid willen geven om zich uit te spreken. We doen dat vandaag ook meer dan 50 jaar na de dood van Martin Luther King. Iemand die nog steeds vanwege zijn geweldige boodschap van geweldloos verzet en zijn enorme inzet voor de gemeenschap waar hij heel veel heeft opgeofferd, die zich nog steeds indruk maakt op ons allemaal, op kinderen, maar ook op volwassenen. Tot op de dag van vandaag is Dr. King een enorme inspiratie voor iedereen in de wereld die het verschil wil maken op het terrein van burgerrechten. En met onze stichting willen we graag Dr. King eren, zijn gedachtegoed levend houden, zorgen dat we op een goede manier, eigen tijdse manier, invulling geven aan een burgerrechtenorganisatie, burgerrecht in Nederland en zorgen voor gelijke behandeling voor iedereen, ongeacht de achtergrond van wie je bent en waar je voor staat. Dat doen wij niet alleen via een lezing, maar ook via een aantal andere activiteiten. Een van de activiteiten komt vanavond ook naar voren, dat is de spoken word wedstrijd. Ja, en iedereen kent natuurlijk de bekende speech van Dr. King over zijn droom die hij uitsprak. I have a dream. Maar hij zei natuurlijk veel meer. Hij zei ook, we cannot walk alone. Hij gaf ons woorden en woorden die heel veel inspiratie, inspiratie geven, maar ook concrete over aanzetten tot daden. En wat hij ook verder zei, we cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. Dat thema van We Cannot Walk Alone past heel goed in dit bijzondere jaar van 2020. We moeten het echt samen doen met elkaar wanneer we allemaal zo enorm in ons isolement zijn gerecht, terecht, terecht geraakt vanwege de coronacrisis en pandemie. Juist nu ook dit jaar vanwege ook de Black Lives Matter en alles wat er afkomt rondom polarisatie, discriminatie, haatzaaierij, racisme, hebben we elkaar meer nodig dan ooit. Waar je ook vandaan bent, wie je ook bent. We hebben met elkaar een samenleving mooi en mooier te maken voor onszelf, maar vooral voor onze kinderen. Later op de avond worden we ook enorm door geïnspireerd door vier jonge spoken word artiesten. Die gaan echt vuurwerk afleveren hier van de bovenste plank. Dit jaar is een vuurwerkverbod, maar vandaag in deze zaal gaat het echt gebeuren. En we sluiten dan ook af met een prachtige artiest, Elton Kiene, die ook heel veel mooie, mooie verhalen gaat delen. Die vooral u gaat raken in het hart en zeker in uw ziel. Food for top, dames en heren. Ja, we gaan zo meteen over naar uh, Dr. Wes Bellamy. Hij wordt ook geïntroduceerd door uh, Maria Toko. Ik wil nog een paar dingen zeggen over Dr. Wes Bellamy. Uh, ik heb hem leren kennen in Brussel tijdens een uh, internationale opleiding, cursus, training, het is maar even hoe je het noemt, op het terrein van inclusief leiderschap. Het was een prachtige, inspirerende week. Uh, Dr. Wes kwam binnen, weet nog heel goed, in een receptie, in een hotelreceptie, lobby in, in, in Brussel. Hij was een beetje verslagen door de jetlag. Maar wat een man, enorm veel charisma. Er kwam echt iemand binnen, een stevige vent en met een fantastisch verhaal. Wat hij heeft meegemaakt in Charlottesville, Virginia, is ongekend. En hij gaat ons vanavond daar ook veel meer over vertellen. Het is een man met heel veel moed, met veel, veel kracht in zich. Maar vooral ook, naast alles, een liefhebbende echtgenoot en een prachtige vader. Ik ben heel benieuwd naar zijn lezing en ik hoop dat jullie allemaal geïnspireerd zullen worden. En ik weet zeker wat gaat gebeuren. Ja, deze lezing is mede mogelijk gemaakt door de bevlogen leden van ons bestuur. Maar dat niet alleen. Ook dankzij de steun van de Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam en uiteraard ook Justice and Peace in Nederland, in Den Haag. Juist ook Justice and Peace, die al langere tijd ook aan ons verbonden is, uh, ben ik, daar ben ik zo enorm dankbaar voor. Super hard gewerkt. Twee mensen in het bijzonder wil ik noemen, daarmee niemand anders tekort doen. Sebastian en Marjolein. Enorm hard gewerkt om deze lezing te realiseren. Daar zijn we heel erg dankbaar voor. En naast Justice and Peace werken we ook heel graag samen en goed samen met de Haagse Hogeschool. Een van de mooiste hogescholen van Nederland, kan ik wel zeggen. Ook vanwege haar veelkleurigheid. En dan brengt me ook op de studentenvereniging Tribes. Ook fantastisch dat jullie er zijn. En zeker ook in de persoon van Maria Toko, die hier vanavond ons volledig gaat verwennen met een mooi verhaal. Ja, ik ben trots dat we hier bij elkaar kunnen zijn, ondanks de situatie waarin we in zitten. Op een online manier op afstand. Volgend jaar hoop ik dat we elkaar weer persoonlijk kunnen treffen bij de volgende lezing. Maar nu gaan we genieten van elkaar en vooral van Dr. King. Ik dank u allen en ik wens u een hele fijne avond toe.
Thank you wel, Dave. Prachtige woorden. Thank you very much, Dave. Very beautiful words. And it's amazing to hear this from a man who has been literally into this game for quite a long time. But we want to go to our keynote speaker. Dr. Wes Bellamy is a very interesting man. He has served as the vice major of Charlottesville, Virginia. And he's also served as the only black individual in the city council. And this was during the infamous Unite the Right rally, which has occurred in Charlottesville, I think around 2017. Dr. Wes Bellamy is the author of, among others, the book Monumental, It Was Never About a Statue. Also, in his story, we hear the experience that he has of serving on the Charlottesville City Council, which was something that he had to do while combating white supremacy. Dr. Valley is also the author of his new book, which is called When White Supremacy Knocks, Fight Back, How White People Can Use Their Privilege and How Black People Can Use Their Power. He's currently serving as the political science department chairman, and of course, we will be hearing him now. Before I go to his very beautiful keynote speech, I would like to also let you know that this man is truly, like the list is long, but it's real too, because he's also the co-chairman of the newly developed Our Black Party. And this is a political platform that focuses on advancing the needs that black people have in America. Please, wherever you are seated, give a warm applause for Dr. Wes Bellamy. My name is Dr. Wes Bellamy, and I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you so much for having me for your Martin Luther King lecture. I cannot speak to how proud I am of young people like yourselves working to change your communities, working to change your city, and ultimately working to change the world. Today, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a word that means a lot to me, sacrifice. Martin Luther King Jr., many of you have read about, but many of us have not thought about the ultimate sacrifice that he gave to his people, to his community, and to the culture. When we talk about sacrifice and Dr. King, a man who was assassinated for fighting for civil rights, I ask you, if he was willing to give his life, what are you willing to give? Some people will say, well, I don't wanna die for fighting for civil rights. Some people will say, I don't want to be uncomfortable while fighting for civil rights. Others will say, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Others will say, I'm willing to put a little bit of what we call in America, skin in the game. Others will say, I'm still trying to figure it out. All of the above are okay. But what's not okay is doing nothing. Every single person has a decision to make. What are you willing to do to bring about change? My favorite Dr. King speech of all time goes a little like this. I come here today to plead with you. Believe in yourself. Believe that you are somebody. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. No Johnsonian civil rights bill can do this for us. No Lincolnian emancipation proclamation can do this for us. If the Negro was to be free, then he or she must sign with a pen, with an ink of self-assertive manhood, their own Emancipation Proclamation. Don't let anybody take your manhood, or womanhood for that matter. Believe in yourself. Believe that you are somebody. I want everybody to know how special they are. Somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made the word white pure and clean and almighty when you look in the dictionary. 
Then they, pro they wrote the word black and they made it ugly and evil and not good. And then he went on to say that he wants to get the language right tonight. He wants to get the language so right that everybody will yell out, yes, they're black, yes, they're proud of it, yes, they're black and they're beautiful. And Dr. King wanted people to understand that it is okay to be different and still fight for what's right. But Dr. King, a man who knew that his life was coming to an end, for in the speech he gave in Memphis, Tennessee, the night before his assassination, he described how he had already been to the mountaintop. He described how he had taken the water as far as he could take it, and now it was up for someone else to do what they had to do in order to carry the load and continue the fight. A man who sacrificed his life, whose family lost a loved one, whose children lost a father, whose wife lost a husband, whose community lost a hero. That was his sacrifice. What is yours? It's a question that I often ask myself. Wes, what are you willing to sacrifice for what's right? What are you willing to sacrifice for the greater good? I think about my own family. And here in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I was the youngest person ever elected to our city council, where I was only the seventh black person ever elected, and where I was an individual who had to go through a great deal of sacrifice. For even at my home right now, there is what we call the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, who are outside of my house because there was a death attempt on my family's life. Someone came to our house in the middle of the night after writing a letter saying that we would be dead by the end of the week. Someone came to our house and they loosened up all of the lug nuts on our tires to try and when we drive off, essentially the tires would fall off and then we would subsequently die. But it didn't work. We persevered through. The higher power had a different calling for us. But we've had people do a lot of different things. We've had bomb threats at my daughter's elementary school. We've had hateful things sent to our house. We've had people try to intimidate my wife or try and say disrespectful things to us while we're out in the community. We've had people blame me and say that I'm single-handedly trying to destroy our city or saying that I was trying to destroy our state or that I was only causing division and causing hate all because I wanted the statues of people who I deemed to be inherently racist removed from our public parks. But none of those things persevered. And when I think about sacrifice, you can't talk sacrifice without talking courage. So now I ask each and every single one of you, what are you willing to sacrifice to make your school a better place, to make your community a better place, to make your family a better place, for you to be a better person? Where's your courage? Where's your courage to challenge that person who thinks that they can intimidate you to fight for what's right? Where's your courage to not fight with your fist, but fight with your mind? Where's your courage to sacrifice the feeling of doing something hateful, but fighting with love? Where's your courage to do research, to find out how you can change policy to make a more equitable and equal place for all? Where's your courage to speak to that person that you normally wouldn't speak to? Where's your courage to go into that community that you normally wouldn't go into and help out? Where's your courage to do the things that people think that you can't do? Where's your courage to stand up for what's right? As a people across the world, we are seeing a wild and crazy time. We're seeing hate groups rise from every corner of the world. We're seeing fascists and people who think that their white supremacist ways and their hateful rhetoric will all make us go away, that they can scare us, that they can intimidate us, that they can make us just stop fighting for the good fight. Where's your courage to stand up to them? In Charlottesville, even with all of the hate, I love my community. Why? Because it's a place that I know the people here have my back. Right, wrong, or indifferent, the people in our community 
for the majority, are gonna stand up and fight for what's right. When people came to our community with torches, with guns, with swords, with shields, trying to scare us, trying to put fear into us, trying to take over our city, we stood up and we fought back. We showed our courage. We showed our character. And then we committed ourselves to working together. Black people, white people, young people, old people, people who don't always get along or even agree, decided that we will not allow hate to win. So I ask you, will you let hate win? Will you allow us to be divided? Or will you look at your brother or your sister or those who you don't agree with and stand and fight with them for what's right? If civil rights is important to us, what will you sacrifice? Why not start today? Let's get to work. Thank you so much, Dr. Wes Bellamy, for joining us. Of course, unfortunately, due to COVID, you cannot be present here. But we're really happy to have you for this Q&A. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you all so much for having me. I wish that I could be in Amsterdam with you all. However, I hope to see you soon. And again, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really pleased to be with you. Well, it's good to know, but I have to correct you a bit. It's The Hague for tonight, but sometimes we're also in, in, in Amsterdam. But no worries, no worries. It's the Netherlands. It's a very small country, so really nearby. <laughs> it's all yeah, good. So the Netherlands, maybe, the Netherlands. You know, it's all good indeed, yeah. So I thought it would be nice maybe if I would introduce myself, also for those who are at home, because I noticed that I haven't done that yet, and especially now that we're going to have this q and I think it's quite like dope if you hear of us, who we are, because I will also be introducing the other Q&A speakers. So my name is Maria Toko. I am a performer, I am a moderator, I am a researcher as a student, also a chair of Student Association Tribes, which of which you will be seeing some students. And I was really excited seeing your keynote and I found it very interesting. And one of the first questions that I have is not necessarily related to your keynote, but more like because of you not being here, if you were here, like what would the what what would you do? What would the first thing be in your agenda? Like you come here, you're in the Netherlands, you can do anything you want to. I would find the black people. So anytime I travel abroad, whenever I like to go to, to Europe or other parts of the world, I like going to find other black people to see how you all are living to see uh, your culture. I love us. And there are so many similarities between those of us in the West, um, those of us in the States, and, and those of us abroad across the world that I think that, well, just for me personally, I enjoy spending time with you all and just, again, uh, understanding the culture, what you like to do, the language, what you like to eat, how you all hang out because we're all family and we're all connected in one way or another. So, so that would be the first thing. Um, and then secondly, probably find some chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice answer. Very nice, very good. Well, maybe next year or in the years that will be coming, you will have the opportunity to still do that. And yes, big be day. You. No big day if I have to come. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I'll, he's hearing you now, so, uh, but I'll, <laughs> Tell him afterwards, actually, like I will push the message even the <laughs> so that he will really understand. Well, thank you. So going to you and the keynote that we heard, you are talking about, among others, um, like how you actually um, just lived your life so far and the different things that you've lived, uh, like especially within the different functions that you have. So for me, it. Um, this is also a question from, from Dave, by the way, so it's uh, me, but you know, make sure that you hear the voice of Dave while I'm talking. Uh -huh. And um, his question was basically related to the, 
one of the speakers that we also ha have had, which was Tiesha Jackson, Jackson, and the title of his, um, like the Martin Luther King lecture back then was Keep Hope Alive. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about Keep Hope Alive, which was the title, um, and we hear what you are talking about. You put the emphasis on sacrifice while he was talking about hope. So the question is, when you are looking at hope, sacrifice, and courage, um, like to what extent are they connected? And how yeah. could you like have sacrificed so much without or with hope? So what is like the connection for you between hope, sacrifice, and courage? Yeah, and, and Reverend Jackson is a mentor of mine. Um, we spent time together here in Charlottesville. He bosses me around every time uh, he comes to town or, or he calls, but that's okay. He just tells me what to do all the time, but that's okay. I love him. I love him the same. Uh, but when we think about keep hope alive, that's something that we would hear a lot of the elders, uh, what we call elders in our community say. That's something that they would say before keep hope alive, no matter what, keep hope alive, keep pushing, keep trying. For me, sacrifice is actually a, a continuance of hope. Mm -hmm. In order for us to continue believing that things will change, we have to be willing to sacrifice some of ourselves. We have to be willing to sacrifice some of our comfort to be able to bring forth that change. In order to have hope, you have to be willing to sacrifice something. If you're willing to sacrifice something, before you can do that, you have to have the courage to be able to do so. So courage, hope, and sacrifice, they all go hand in hand. First, we have to be able to believe that things will get better. That's the hope. That's the optimism. That's the belief that, that we will make this better no matter what. We will win. And then the courage comes in saying that because I know that this will happen, I have my hope, I believe that this will happen, I'm willing to sacrifice something to bring about the change. What is that sacrifice? Is that making ourselves uncomfortable by talking to someone who you normally wouldn't talk to? Does that mean that you're willing to sacrifice some time and go and mentor or tutor or help out some kids who, who need your guidance? Does that mean that you're willing to, to speak up and speak out about things that you wanna see made differently? Those are the things that we have to push ourselves to and I love the fact that we're having this conversation on International Civil Rights Day. And I love the fact that you all in the Netherlands are pushing yourselves to bring forth that change. So much respect and much love to you. Thank you. Quick note before we continue to the next question. You might see me looking, bang down my head, watching on a screen. It's not because, you know, I'm chatting with my friends, but it's because actually I'm making sure that whenever you guys at home have a question, that I can also check it. And if we have the time, of course, I will ask it directly, but make sure for those who are at home, if you have your questions, put them in the chat room and definitely Dr. West will be looking at it even after this Q&A. Yes. So another thing is that there might be a little like kind of we can slow things down maybe and that's because we are having a live connection as i already mentioned we have dr west bellamy live from the usa which means that sometimes especially with like all the technical things that are going around there can be a fragment of silence but in the meanwhile you can look at this face right here so i hope you don't mind that well, we love it we love it we love it. <laughs> Thank you. Without further ado, I want to actually continue to the next question that we have. It's a question from Kathleen Ferrier. Unfortunately, she cannot be here in person um, because of the fact that we have COVID and yeah, limited spots are available. We know the drill right now. This is a 2020 event, so we shouldn't be that surprised. But I do want to introduce her to you because she is the chairperson of the Netherlands UNESCO committee and she's a former politician. A great example to many women here in the Netherlands when it comes to her food for thought and just how she stands in life. And for those who are here, know her also as the former chair of the Martin Luther King Lecture Foundation. Please take a look at the video with the question of Kathleen Ferry. Dr. Bellamy, you ask us, what do you do 
to bring about change. And you point out that we all have a different and specific role to play. You also point out the importance of language. And I would like to ask you if you can elaborate a bit more on your views on how language, the words we choose, can be a powerful instrument to bring about change. Thank you so much. Well, the words that we use are very important. And, and before I answer the question, I want to give some kudos and some love to Kathleen, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. She's a hero of mine, as well as many others here in the States. So thank you for all the work that, that you have done, Kathleen, and I hope you're watching. When we talk about the words that we use and how important they are, I think we all have to be aware of how we deliver our message. When, when we're trying to educate people or when we're trying to convince people to understand where we're coming from, when we're trying to come to a common ground in regards to fighting together, how we speak to each other makes a world of difference. But I personally believe that as important it is to talk to each other in a way that the message can be received, it's equally important to listen. So how we listen to people and how we understand what they're saying and where they're coming from can dictate not only how we respond, but how we work together moving forward. We have to be clear, not everybody's going to get along and I don't have to love you 100% of the time in order for us to work together. What we have to be willing to do is respect each other. What we have to be willing to do is listen to each other. And what we have to also be willing to do is understand that we are fighting for the same thing. Those are the people who are on your side. But for those who aren't on your side and those who don't understand where you're coming from, are we willing to be patient enough with them to wait for them to progress to where we're going to be? And if they, and, and, and are we also willing to understand that they may never come along to where we are? And that's okay. How we speak to each other can dictate how far we go, but how we speak to each other can also talk to how we're looking to move things forward. And I hope that you all are not only speaking to each other in a polite way when it's necessary, speaking boldly when it's necessary, not afraid to make people uncomfortable when it's necessary, but most importantly, always pushing forward. Thank you so Thank much you for so answering much. this question. I found it personally very, yeah, very interesting and, and very um, thought, like it had a lot of different aspects, this question. And I'm really happy that you were able to touch upon the different parts of this question. So thank you very much. Um, so I would like to continue to the next uh, Q&A participant, which is Rudy van der Beek. He is actually like the, your answer at the first question where you were talking about not only speaking boldly, but being someone who can mentor, uh, being a role model. Well, he's all of that and even more. <laughs> this man is the founder of Student Association Tribes. He's currently actually helping the board and leading, uh, have, have, he's having a very important uh, like function in leading the board and both the community. He's an enormous community builder. Here in The Hague, there are a lot of people who know him. He's also a safety and security management student. So he's kind of, I think like, maybe close to what, what you are. Yeah, but then in the Netherlands, and since it's a small city, small country, I mean, yeah, it's a bit, you know, but <laughs> make sure that we all here and at home give a round of applause for Rudy van der Beek. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, you're giving me too much credit. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bellamy. Uh, my question was about sacrifice. You spoke about it earlier. Um, mm -hmm. And with this continuous journey of more equal rights with justice, which you often notice is that uh, we're on the side with people who also face the injustices, but sometimes a lot of people are not always comfortable with making a sacrifice. Therefore, yeah. we all try to have like a better um, society for all of us, but, not, but sometimes our peers are not convinced yet to be able to make the sacrifice. So yeah. my question is, how do we convince our peers um, to also continue with this journey, to also have this battle with us for more justice in this world? 
Thank you so much, Rudy, for the question. I've heard a lot about you even before we, wow. we have the talk. I heard that we're very similar. So one, I wanna encourage you, my brother, to keep pushing. I'm proud of you, man. And, and let's make Thank sure you. we connect after this. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of you. Uh, you. But to answer your, yes, sir. But to answer your question, I think, I, so I try to live by this one particular, this model or this phrase. It's called patient with people, but impatient with progress. You have to be patient with people because our friends, our family members, the people who we agree with, the people who we don't agree with, the world for that matter, everyone progresses at their own speed. Everyone comes along at their own pace. People decide to fight when they're ready. People decide to understand things and then go out and make change when they're ready. It has to be on their time. So we have to be patient with them to understand that they're all growing and evolving at their own pace. They don't grow and understand things or have the same kind of uh, push and drive like we may have because they have a different set of experiences. So we have to be patient with them. We can't force them to do what we want them to do because they don't see things the exact same way that we see them. They see them as they see them. So patient with them. But we must always be impatient with progress. You, I, the people who are behind you, Dave, the people who are putting this together, your fellow students, your fellow community members, everyone who has agreed that they will stand up and do and fight for what's right, we must be impatient with progress. We must consistently fight for. We must consistently be bold in asking and demanding for change. We must be consistent when pushing for things to be better, not tomorrow, but today. Our role, our responsibility is to continue to push as hard as we can because that is our charge. Not everyone will understand that charge. We can't make them feel bad for not understanding it. But what we have to do is keep pushing as we're supposed to. The best way to teach someone a lesson is for you to be the lesson. The best way for someone to understand why this is important is for you to live every single day showing them why this is important. Understand what I said, showing them, not telling them. You show people with your work why this is important. You encourage them and you invite them to come in but you don't condemn, condemn them or, or make them feel bad for not doing what you want them to do right now. One thing that I think you'll learn as you get a little older, because I've learned this as I've gotten older, is that again, people do things when they're ready. And if we get upset with every single person who doesn't understand the movement, we'll always walk around mad. Let's take joy and appreciate the people who are fighting beside us instead of being upset with those who aren't there yet. They'll come along when they're supposed to, but for you and I, for those behind you, for everyone else who believes what we believe, we keep fighting. We'll win. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Push Dr. West. Well, this was a very, interesting uh, question and also I think it touched upon like some of the personal struggles that we can see. Um, I hope that even you back home recognize some of the things that have been asked. But we're going now to the next question, which is a question of Maxence Freda. Maxence Freda is a young lady who is currently also a board member. She is to be specific to be, specific, to be specifically correct, she is, I need a DJ, I think, like, I think I need a <laughs> DJ. <laughs> but anyhow, she is now the Secretary of Student Association Tribes. She's also a board member activities of Study Association Trinitas here at The Hague University of Applied Sciences. And a very nice title that she's wearing now is that she is the first female chair of the University Council of The Hague University. Please a round of applause for Maxence Freda. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming and giving me this opportunity. Um, I want you to ask a question about courage because you mentioned in your video that courage is really important. Um, but how uh, can black people, especially black people in a young age, get this courage? 
because it's really hard to um, speak out your voice in situations that it is uncomfortable for you and yeah. to have the courage to apply for a job uh, sometime or for a high title. So how can people from black age or black young age can uh, get this courage? Mm. Well, I firmly believe that we have to encourage them. The courage that you have right now to speak at this stage and to, to get all of the positions that you got, let me ask you a question. Where did you find your courage? Question, um, like talking to Rudy, for example, and talking to Maria, they gave me the courage to do it. It's like having your ground and yeah. they push me to do it. So having the right people around you give me the courage to do those things. So that's the answer. We all have a responsibility to encourage others to do this work. Even at your age, you have a responsibility to encourage those who are coming behind you to use their voice, to speak out, and also for you to be the example for them. I remember being maybe five or six years old the first time that I was told that I was special. And then I just started believing it. My aunts, people in my neighborhood, uh, people in my community, they would say things to me like, you're special, you're different, you're going to be something someday, you're going to be a, a, a good person, you're going to change the world one day. And then I just started believing it. And once you believe something, you start conducting and carrying yourself in a certain way. You start saying, yeah, I am special. Yeah, I do need to use my voice. Yeah, I do need to speak out. So you have a responsibility to encourage the next group of people. All of you in that room have a responsibility to encourage the next group of people. And then when we are on social media, when we're talking to our family members, when we are, are just hanging out, we need to put out messages of encouragement. It's fun to laugh and it's fun to joke. And as we say in America, get ratchet. I don't know if y'all know about that. Like we, we, we have a lot of fun, sometimes too much fun in America. That's all, that's all cool. Like that's dope, that's, it's, it's all good. But then what are we doing to encourage the next group of people to become the leaders that we know that they can be? How do we encourage them to find and use their voice? It's by one, us being the model, but secondly, being intentional about speaking to young people, how important it is for them to do what they're supposed to do. And as I said in the last question, patient with people, impatient with progress, we live encouragement. Everywhere we go, we speak about encouraging people. Everywhere we go, we speak about empowering our people. Everywhere we go, we talk about how beautiful it is to be Black, how proud we are of being Black, how we do work together, why we do love each other, how I don't have to know you to love you, why I will not be afraid of you because you're my brother or you're my sister. Those kind of things encourage people without us even saying words. That's what we have to do. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maxence. Thank you, Dr. Wes. So um, we have another question from Graydon, and Graydon is a recent grad uh, on international management, and he's currently working at Justice and Peace, and he's actually one of the people behind the scenes to say, so we're getting some insight on those behind the scenes, y'all. Uh, get ready for his question, because he's actually from near Charlottesville in the U.S. Oh. Graydon. Okay. Um, hi, yes, Dr. Bellamy. Thank you so much for your inspiring speech first. Um, yeah, um, I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, so one of the things you mentioned was um, the importance of listening to your opponents and, and also being an example. Um, and my question for you is, alongside being an example and alongside listening to your opponents, what can you also say to them? Great question. I got one for you though. Where, where are you from? Where, where close to Charlotte? <laughs> I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Ah, Vietnam, 910. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Much love to Fayetteville, man. J. Cole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Fayetteville. Um, so, so that's a great question. What, what do we say? What do we say to, to people to help them understand? I think there are a couple of things. One, when we're telling our story, it's important for us to understand that people may not get where we're coming from. And that's okay. But it's not always your job to make them feel comfortable. It's your job to tell your story. That's the first thing. Your job is solely to tell your story. 
The second thing is understanding your audience. And when we say understand your audience, I remember being in Charlottesville and having conversations with people who I know did not like me. They did not like me at all. So was it my job at that particular that, at that particular point in time to yell at them and tell them that everything that they think was wrong and that I don't like them at all and I know they don't like me and we can just fight each other? No, that wasn't my job. That wasn't my role. That, that's not what I chose to do at that point in time. What I chose to do was show a side of myself that was a human side. Before uh, they, they, they saw me as a, a city council person, before they saw me um, as an individual who's a leader or whatever, they just saw me as a black man. And I want them to understand what my position is and how it feels for me to walk in my shoes in this position with the things that I see around me. And it's up to them to receive that. But again, as I alluded to, all that I can do is tell my story. That's understanding the audience. Now, the, the next point is when we're talking about how do we or what do we say to our opponents, we have to ask them, do they love their, their country? Do they love their community? Do they love their neighborhood? And if they love their country, they love their community, they love their neighborhood, then why won't they allow us to be able to have the same love for it? I often say to people, because I love America, because I love Virginia, because I love Charlottesville, I don't love everything about it. I don't like everything that's happened here in it, but because I love this place, I have a responsibility to hold this place accountable. Love is accountability. Love is also pointing out things when they're not right. Love is having difficult conversations. Love is also being empathetic and sympathetic that everybody doesn't understand what you're saying or sympathetic that things or people may feel different ways about it. But nonetheless, I cannot sacrifice myself and my feelings, I can sacrifice a lot, but not myself and my feelings in order for you to continue to put me down. So those are some of the things that we talk about when we're having these discussions. And, and more importantly, like we alluded to earlier, patient with people, but impatient with progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Wes. <laughs> and thank you. And thank you, Graydon. So we're gonna to go to the next question and we have to speed it up a little bit. Shanika Romney is the next who will be asking a question. She is a very hardworking young lady. She has her own podcast, and which is called Say Less Sis, so you better make sure that you look for <laughs> that one because it's nice. There we she's go. also a board member of Student Association Tribes and she's leading our activities. She's so much more than that. But I want to introduce you and give the floor to Shanika Romney. All right. Good evening. Thank you, Maria, for that introduction. And also good evening to you, Dr. West. Um, my question for you this evening is, what strategy do you, Dr. West Bellamy, use to encourage people of other ethnicities to join in the fight for black rights? Mm. It's a great question, and, and thank you so much, Shanika. I got to make sure I check out your podcast. I'm going to do that when we get <laughs> off, okay? Say less sis, right? Yes. All right, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out. <laughs> Say less sis. So, so how do we encourage people from other ethnicities to join in the fight? Well, one, I wrote about this in my book, uh, my, my second book, When White Supremacy Knocks Fight Back, how white people use their privilege, how black people use their power. Uh, I think it's important for, for white people or people of other ethnicities to understand that they all have privilege. And do they use their privilege for good or do you use it for bad? And how do you use your privilege for good? When you see someone being mistreated, do you use your privilege or because you may be given the benefit of the doubt to help someone out or do you just ignore it and walk away? And it goes back to the question that I just answered a second ago. Do we want our community to be a better place for all people? If they want our community to be a better place for all people, then they have to use their voice in order to help us out. But ultimately, the best way to show people that change is needed is by you working to make change. You know, while, while I, I love helping other people understand why this work is important, I must always remember that I have to make sure that we work for us first. So Black people, whether you're in America, whether you're in the Netherlands, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Jamaica or Africa, we have to ensure that we take care of ourselves first. 
we have to ensure that we're loving each other first. We have to ensure that we are educating and encouraging each other first. And before I can help anyone else understand why you must help me, I must work to help with my own people. Secondly, again, when we show white people or other ethnicities or wherever they're from, why we need their assistance and why they need to use their voice, we hold them accountable and give them specific steps in, in terms of things that they can do to help us out. Your podcast, for example, is a great way to show people and let people listen and learn why we need allies or, or what we call allies here in America. So I hope that you're continuing to do the work in which you're doing. And if you all have any more, uh, you need any more tips, make sure you get the book. It's on Amazon, White Supremacy Not Fight Back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lez. Thank you, Shanika. So we're gonna go to the next person who is called Don Sater. He is um, a lawyer, but he's also a speaker and a council, city council member to be precise, in Amsterdam. You will be seeing his video right now. Dear Dr. Bellamy, thank you so much for your contribution to this year's Martin Luther King reading. Me, myself, as a city council member of the city of Amsterdam, have to deal with inclusion and discrimination, both as a politician working out policies, but also as an individual living in the city. I was wondering, you as a former politician and city council member in Charlottesville, look at local po politics, their influences and their role compared to the role and influences of the civil society do you think that there's overlap and do you think that their roles should be defined more clearly? I was wondering if you can answer that question and thank you so much for your contribution. It's a great question. So, so to answer the, the, later, the latter part, yes, I think roles need to be clearly defined, but I also believe that there is some overlap. When we talk about local authority and we talk about local leaders, we need to make sure that people understand that the quickest way to create change in your community is locally. Those are your city council persons or the people who represent your local community on a government level. That is the, the quickest and fastest way, in my opinion, to be able to have a direct impact on your schools, on your neighborhoods, on your stores, on your community engagement and so forth. So we have to be in tune, as we would say over here, or tapped in like the, new people, like the younger kids say, with what's going on locally and ensuring that we are electing people and supporting people in office who represent and understand the needs of our communities. When we talk about the overlap piece though, I think that that's where political education is important. Understanding the role of government in your municipality or wherever it is that you live is important. Being engaged in the voting process is important. And then subsequently, I would encourage all of you to think about running for office. If you want to, to be a change, if you, you want to see things change and you're tired of things being the way in which they are, then run for office yourself. Who says that you can't do so? Who's stopping you? Who's saying that, that you're not qualified or that you're not allowed to do it? People will always find ways to make you feel as if you're inadequate or that you're not good enough. But I promise you that you are. And even if you don't win, you will learn from the experience. So think about doing it, understanding what we must do politically and educate ourselves. But last but not least, all work is local. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank that you. was a very specific answer, especially for, for the question that Don asked. Um, you're good. I have to give you that <laughs> compliment, honestly. Yeah. Sometimes. So, <laughs> yeah, a round of applause for you. It's very interesting to hear how, how specific you are when you're answering these questions. And uh, it's very much something that we can learn uh, from, both young and those who are already in the game for a longer time. So unfortunately, we have uh, a lot of questions coming up from like the, the chat room, but we're not able to answer them all. So for those who are at home, Make sure that you keep on asking the questions and I'll be um, Can we do one? For... Can we take one? Yes, yes. I just wanted to say that we're on the same line. 
Hey, <laughs> from the Netherlands to the USA. Yeah. All right. So one of the questions that we actually got is, do you have an advice for the people who are willing to use violence for the cause of peace and justice? Um, the person who's asking this is saying that I know activists who are tired of non-violence activism. Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. So, so the first part, the first question that you all asked me tonight was about hope and encourage and sacrifice and i believe that in order for us to bring about change we can use our voice we can use our mind but we don't always have to use our fists or use violence now some people don't believe in that some people think that the only way to get people's attention is by breaking things or by hurting things or meeting force with force i don't personally believe that to always be true However, I do believe that people have to understand what kind of change it is that they want to make long term. If you go and hurt someone tomorrow, is that going to make a long term change down, down the road? I don't believe that to be true. If you change a policy tomorrow, that can have an impact 10 years down the road. So we have to understand what the long game is. Do you want to hurt someone tomorrow to make you feel good right now? Or do you want to change a law that will be able to eventually help your children and grandchildren 10, 20 years from now? Let's play the long game, not the short game. And remember everybody, patient with people, impatient with progress. We will win this fight because we always do. Thank you for your very clear answer. This question came from Fatima Akshar. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you for asking your questions. And honestly, we are seeing your questions and they're so interesting that Quest Bellamy will be answering them. Um, so keep on asking these questions. Thank you so much. So going to the last question to round this Q&A off. Um, I am very curious about, like we've heard from you You've shared a part of your story. You've been able to bring us along with your like train of thoughts when it comes to answering our questions. And one of the things that we do wonder is, um, so we don't want you to walk alone in this struggle, in this, this fight for justice. So how can we as students, as citizens here in the Netherlands help you? The, the best way for you all to help me is to help each other. We, I get encouragement from seeing you all fighting, using your voice, speaking up, and standing up for change. That's the best way to help me. And most importantly, in the Netherlands and those of you at the university, I want you to, to stop looking to America to bring about all of the change in your communities. America has our issues and we do things one way, but the way in which you all fight, the way in which you all are, are making change is powerful. Believe in yourselves that what you are doing is right. I, I, I want to make sure that you all understand that the work that you are doing, people are watching. So please believe that the work that you are doing is bringing forth change. When I met Dave, I was blown away by all of the stuff that he was doing. That made me feel good to know that I had a brother who was uh, halfway across the world who was doing the same things that I was working on. That means that we're not working alone. When I heard about the young man earlier who people were telling me, I think his name was uh, Derek Deidre, they were saying, yeah, he, he's, he's very similar to you. He, he's doing these things in the community. He's working hard. When I, meet, when I met our moderator, when I saw all of you speaking and asking questions, and hearing about your, your roles and your titles, the young man who's gonna do the spoken word later. When I, when I see all of you and I see the culture, that makes me know and feel proud. So if you wanna help me, continue doing the work. Continue being who you are. Keep pushing and keep fighting. Let's connect on Instagram or let's connect on social media and keep this fight going. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. A lot of hearts here, like from those in the back. So I'm just, you know, this is what you're seeing here <laughs> behind the scenes. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Like even 
if you're not here, we still feel like the power of your voice and the presence and the energy. You're really bringing that vibe here. So we really want to thank you for not only giving like us the opportunity to ask you questions, but also to truly be true to who you are and be being able and capable of like taking us with you like through the lessons that you have learned. Thank you so much. Please, for those back at home, uh, keep on asking your questions. But now I want to thank Dr. West Bellamy and we're going to go to the spoken word. We cannot talk about spoken word without talking about Elton Kina. Elton Kina is a spoken word artist, presenter, and he is a workshop teacher. Dr. Mr. Kino, well, I'm talking about doctors right now because we uh -huh. have Dr. West. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's your next title. <laughs> Mr. Kina is the founder of SPRAS. He's also the co-founder of the Vorda and Vorda Vorda Zine platform. And he has performed in numerous countries worldwide. In 2020, he even received the Zuid-Holland Culture prize, which is from the Prince Bernard Culture Foundation. And this is a prize that you get if you're recognized for your ability to engage with a broad audience in the literary programs. And Alton especially is valued by the support that he gives to young poets, artists. Please a warm applause for Alton Kina, head of our jury contest of the spoken word. Thank you all. Mm. So I'm going to do this in Dutch. Nederlands. Please go ahead. Mag zo zo applaus voor jou, want je doet het fantastisch. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, Dr. West Bellamy, like the power, man, energy and rhythm, it's, it's, it sounds like a, like a poem, like a, a spoken word piece. I don't know if you... Ah. What am I? What am I? Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. I'm going to translate in Dutch. Um, <clears throat> jury voorzitter, best wel een hele mond vol. Um, nou, laat me gewoon beginnen met het feit dat vandaag natuurlijk een hele belangrijke dag is en dat spoken word niet mag ontbreken op zo'n dag als vandaag. Omdat natuurlijk er zit heel veel ritme in, uh, in de speech van Martin Luther King. Iedereen weet dat als je Dr. West Bellamy hoort, dan hoor je ook de ritme constant. Dus spoken word is all about ritme. En um, Bob Schons, een bekende in de Nederlandse scene, zij zei, uh, zij zei als je wil weten wat er in de wereld gebeurt, dan moet je luisteren naar spoken word. Mm -hmm. Dus dat is eigenlijk een paar dingen die ik wilde vertellen. Uh, ik kan niet al te lang praten, want we hebben natuurlijk best wel een strak schema waar we ons aan moeten houden. Dus uh, laten we beginnen met het feit dat ik heel blij ben en namens de jury spreek dat er zoveel aanmeldingen waren bij de, uh, de Martin Luther King Spoken Word wedstrijd. En het was super moeilijk om daar vier mensen uit te kiezen. En die vier personen die we hebben uitgekozen, de genomineerden zijn vandaag aanwezig. Die gaan zo meteen alle vier een stuk voordragen. En daarna gaan we bekendmaken ja, wie eerst, de tweede, de derde en wie een publieksprijs krijgt of een... Uh, um, aanmoedigingsprijs uh, krijgt. En daarnaast krijgen ze allemaal ook een gratis bundel, een lockdown bundel die nergens te verkrijgen is. Je kan het niet kopen, maar je gaat het vandaag wel krijgen. Gesponsord door Poto International en Stichting Droom. En daad, uh, dat gezegd te hebben, wil ik alle juryleden even opnoemen. Is dat, is dat oké? Okay? Is, dat, is dat een goed moment ja, om dat te gaan doen? Ja, doe je ding. Ja, Iedereen ik denk dat het wel een goede, goede timing is daarvoor. Ja, toch? Ja. Praat snel, want we zitten op het klokje. Uh, sowieso in de jury uh, zat uh, Helen van der Wijst, uh, Dominica uh, uh, en Janice Romney, die jullie net ook hebben gezien. Als ik de naam verkeerd heb uitgesproken, het spijt me zeer. Shanika, Shanika, dankjewel. Je mag me corrigeren trouwens. Hè. Corrigeer me. Het is belangrijk dat we, ons, dat we elkaar <laughs> corrigeren, toch? Ja, yes, zeker. Uh, en ik natuurlijk. Had, uh, we hebben het heel moeilijk gehad. Er waren zoveel aanmeldingen en we moesten streng zijn. Um, het is nooit leuk om streng te zijn. Maar we zijn vooral trots omdat alle, alle aanmeldingen waren keihard, waren mooie video's. We hebben het niet gedaan op papier, we hebben dus naar video's gekeken. Wat spoken word moet je horen, spoken word moet je, voel, moet je voelen. En uh, we gaan luisteren naar de vier genomineerden. Ik ga ze heel kort aankondigen uh, in willekeurige volgorde. En meteen daarna gaan we bekendmaken wie derde, tweede, eerste en de aanmoedigingsprijs krijgt. Yes? Alright. Uh, als eerste wil ik, wil ik uh, Myron Hemming naar voren roepen. Kom naar voren, all the way van het Hoge Noorden. Take it away. Een warm applaus voor Myron. Tot hier. 
tot meer dan genoeg. Ik herken het tot hier en niet verder aan hun ingegraven hielen. Een statement gebouwd van onze lichamen, we weten. Niet als geen ander, maar als zoveel voor ons. Een fundament gebouwd van schouders om door te geven. We weten dat een klank, de onze, op een gegeven moment zich mag laten verschalken tot echo. Mag vervaren in de ruimte nog te overbruggen. En we weten dat we het genot van arriveren nog niet hebben mogen ervaren. Ik erken dat we nog onderweg zijn. Ik erken dat we een echo enkel kunnen tolereren in de aanwezigheid van nieuwe stemmen, van nieuwe klanken. Ja, ik hoorde hem laatst, voor het eerst hardop, dat hij het ook niet zeker weet. Hij zei, men ziet mij in kleur. Ik ben iets van bruin, ik ben iets van blank. Ik ben zwart, zelfs gid. Ik ben bijna bruin of een meest donkere tint van wit. Men vond hem te dit om dat te zijn en te dat om wit te zijn. Maar toch was hij smetteloos, zuiver en onbevlekt, puur en ongerept van kleur. Hij wist niet als geen ander, maar als zoveel voor ons. We hebben Genoeg en hebben we al te veel moeten nemen. Het moet anders nu. In de strijd die moest en zou plaatsvinden. Doorboren wij vermoeide spieren. Schudden elkaar vreed naar achteren, naar voren. Je moet sterk zijn voor je zuster, voor je broeder. Ik zal dat zijn voor jou. En zusters en broeders, noem het geen vluchten. Daarvoor hebben we te veel om achter te laten. Noem het onderweg zijn, noem het arriveren. Alsjeblieft, spreek niet meer van toekomst. Spreek enkel van vandaag. Alsjeblieft, kijk niet meer in de ogen van kleur. Kijk in de ogen van de mens. Hij zei, je moet sterk zijn, vriend. In het zwart van zij die immer voorwaarts. In de belofte gekerfd, in de palm van onze handen. In het git van onze huiden hebben wij een naam verkregen. Met andermans grenzen om in te vroeten. Wie je de huid strak trok. Als lichamen van stukken stug leer brandend in de felste zon. Je deed lezen in ons adem, het onthulsel diep Afrikaans gedoopt. Je, de, je deed leven in ons open wond, die volgens hen maar niet wilde helen. Zelfs het litteken van de diepste dalen. Zelfs het litteken geschild van de hoogste daken. Zelfs het litteken bewees ons geen dienst meer. Hier, hier leerde hij lezen in geheel de wond. Hij zei, je moet sterk zijn, vriend. Hij zei, je moet sterk zijn, vriend. Hij wilde, hij wilde lezen in geheel de wond. Hij vond stukken bloot lichaam en leer onderweg tot versleten gedragen door schouder. Schouders die beloften droegen met gestriemd vel. Zusters en broeders, bouw. Bouw op mijn schouders en klim. Klim tot hoogte, zo verstelbaar hoog. Dat meters boven de hoogste toppen. Laat ons spieken achter elke horizon. Laat ons geen zon meer ondergaan. Laat ons stijgen met geheven borst en gerechte ruggen. Laat ons voorwaarts. Laat ons immer voorwaarts. Laat ons klinken als zusters en broeders die nog durven te dromen. Laat ons elkaar beloven geen moment te vergeten. Waar we samen staan. En van waar we samen zijn gekomen. Dankjewel, Meiren. Wauw, ik zei het net al, spoken word moet je voelen. Je kwam binnen kijken, je merkt ook meteen van hoe meer, hoe meer men is gegroeid. Er zit maar een paar, zit maar een week tussen. Vuur, dankjewel. We gaan meteen verder uh, to the stage. Naar de microfoon, mag ik een warm applaus voor Jong Talent, Amara van der Elst. Heb je naast de lief, is wat we leerden. Lief hebben, ja, dat was de les. Terwijl we luisterden naar Malcolm, naar elke droom van Dr. King, lieten we ons raken, bleven we aantekeningen maken tot na de laatste echo was weggestorven. Waar is het dan fout gegaan? Jij bent niet helemaal Nederlands, hè? Helemaal niet Nederlands, zo voelde het soms. Ondefinieerbaar, exotisch. Het was nooit op een slechte manier bedoeld. Ze kon er niet zo goed tegen als mensen in de eerste paar seconden van de ontmoeting al moesten weten wat haar afkomst was. Ze was geen supermarktfruit, dus dan zou dat niets uit hoeven maken. Toch? Ze wilde begrepen, maar is zichzelf geworden. Nu spreek ik alsof ik haar nooit geweest ben. Zie, ik zat wel in de klas, maar was niet altijd bij de les. Dus nu zit ik met vragen. Ik zie een beschaving. Beschadigd. Door mannen in uniform. We hebben nog steeds mannen in uniformen. Passen die nog in onze pluriforme samenleving? Martin had dromen, maar in 2020 noemen wij onszelf wakker. We leren samen helen, samen delen. Wat als we leren lief te geven? 
Even wat als we leren liefde, delen, liefde, delen. Hou je van mij? Hou je van mij? Je ligt. Je kan me aanraken, aanbidden, verafgoden, vereren, maar je kan me niet lief hebben. Je hebt me niet lief, je hebt me niet. Ik weiger nog langer bezit te zijn van de mannen in zwart-wit gemaakte foto's. Witte huizen, witte pakken, witte huiskleur, volle zakken. Van de mannen in de zalen die me telkens weer applaus geven omdat ik de klappen van het leven zo mooi ritmisch incasseer. Ik strijd. Punchline na punchline blijf raken tot ze beseffen dat geweld niet nodig is om iets geweldig te maken. Ik wil dit al zo lang zeggen, maar met elk vraagteken dwaal ik verder van mijn punt. Tijden veranderen. De era van woorden en beloftes is voorbij. Eerdaags hoor je dat actie voortkomt uit jou, uit mij. En het kan dat onze zogenaamde migratieachtergrond niet bij hen in de gratie valt. Integratie faalt, het maakt niets uit. Het gaat niet om waar je vandaan komt, maar om wie je bent en waar je heen wil. Ik wil niet dat je denkt dat ik zielig ben. Ik wil dat je me ziet, erkent, want we dragen allemaal wat onder de leden. En ondanks het lijden, leiden we ons eigen leven. Ik denk dat ik de les weer weet. Er is altijd iemand met een groter leed. Er is altijd iemand die iets groters deed. Als je ons vergelijkt, zijn we verre van gelijk. Maar onder dat alles blijkt, wij zijn gelijkwaardig. Dank jullie wel. Mare van der Elst. Krachtig, prachtig, mooi. We gaan meteen verder. De derde persoon, en nogmaals, het is een willekeurige gevolg die ik naar voren ga roepen, is Ashi Sioma. The voice of a brave man, a king, Martin Luther King, still alive and kicking. In the beginning, there was just the word. The word became a walk, the walk became action, not alone. And as he walked, we walk, and as he thought, we thought, and as he do, we do. We cannot walk alone towards home. I have a dream that one day, this day, we shall not turn back, neither turn away, because I'm more than sure there is a higher way reaching for the, from the stars, far away from injust us, far away from Black Lives Matter. Then we all make sure all truth reach up front. Stop barking like a hungry dog, feeding all with lies. Do you remember the voice? of a brave man, a king, Martin Luther King, still alive and kicking. Through ups and downs, through failures and lies, through truth and why, through strength and power, through wisdom and thought, through knowing and love. We, the all of the universe, the black hole, the stars of the all. We can keep on fighting for a place in this space, a recognition in this vision, 
But instead of walking alone, walking together is way much better. Thought became word. The word became a walk. The walk became action. And this time, as I said, in the spirit of Martin Luther King, still alive and kicking, through me, a queen, we, he, all nations, my nation, will not walk alone towards home, but together. Of course, not only because black lives matter, but as simply as it is, all lives matter. Asisioma. Wow, powerful. Ik moet je gewoon zeggen van ik vind outfit en ik ga lekker op goud, dus dank je wel. Nice. Mooi, dank je wel. Ah oh man, I feel privileged om hier aanwezig te zijn om live performances te zien. Weet je, het, het is niet vanzelfsprekend vandaag de dag. We zijn allemaal een soort van privilege at the moment. We hebben nog eentje. Um, ik ga meteen naar voren roepen. Ex Hagenees, tegenwoordige Rotterdammer. Mag ik een warm applaus voor Karim en Uta, ook wel bekend als Benzo Karim. Dit is voor Martin Luther King, soms een eenzame strijd voor een gezamenlijke winst. Dit is alle kleuren zijn samen zwart. Dit is een oproep voor een omroep die loopt op onze pad. Dit is niet ieder zijn eigen weg. Dit is niet alleen letten op wat je zegt, maar ook op wat je denkt. Dit is sterker door strijd, dit is vrede en recht. En ik heb gisteren nog gedroomd over broeders en zusters die niet meer leefden in nood. Ik reed langs politiewagens afvragend waarom ik niet etnisch werd gecontroleerd. Ik voerde belastingsformulieren in zonder dat ik extra werd gecontroleerd. Ik zag wapens vervangen worden door lakens om warmte te creëren. Ik zag bommen vervangen worden door sommen om kinderen wat te leren. Ik zag littekens niet als teken van oorlog en geweld, maar ongelukken tijdens een onschuldig spel. Ik zag liefde, vrede, ben tijd niet zo weinig angst hoeven te beleven. Ik zag ze glimlachen, niemand was minachtend. Er was een vorm van samenleven. Als het aan mij lag, was ik daar gebleven. Als het aan mij lag, was ik nooit gestopt met dromen. Zou ik Black Lives Matter blijven schreeuwen totdat het bij zij die niet voelen zou binnenkomen? Zou ik ze zeggen dat ze moeten stoppen met het bespotten van mijn profeet? Zou ik de daden zeggen dat hij niet degene is die bepaalt of iemand doodgaat of iemand leeft? Zou ik zorgen dat vrouwen altijd veilig de straat op kunnen gaan? Dat ze op de maatschappelijke ladder aan mannen gelijk staan. En ik weet het, ik ben een dromer. En, ho en ho hoewel de weg lang is, we kunnen er komen. Maar je hoeft niet meer alleen te lopen. You will never walk alone als Feyenoord en Liverpool. Je hoeft nooit alleen te lopen voor een gezamenlijk doel. You will never walk alone als Feyenoord en Liverpool. Je hoeft nooit alleen te lopen als je vecht voor een gezamenlijk doel. Benzo Karim, Karim Aluta. Wauw. Um, vier krachtige geluiden, vier verschillende geluiden, vier niet dezelfde geluiden, maar alle vier krachtig. Weet je, het was echt een moeilijke taak met de jury om te gaan kijken van oké, okay, welke, wie is nummer één, wie is nummer twee, wie is nummer drie. En, en weet je, het klinkt misschien cliché, maar jullie zijn allemaal winnaars, weet je. Um, prijs is symbolisch. Ik ga wel even erbij vertellen van uh, wat de prijzen inhouden, wat het inhoudt. Dat is denk ik wel belangrijk om te weten, ook voor de mensen thuis. Uh, de nummer 1, de winnaar, krijgt natuurlijk een bedrag van 500 euro. En uh, ik hoor een telefoon. En een lockdown bundle, gesponsord door Poto International. De nummer 2 krijgt een bedrag van 350 euro en een lockdown bundle, of course. En de nummer 3 krijgt een bedrag van 150 euro. En er is eigenlijk geen nummer vier, maar dit hebben we erbij geroepen omdat we het belangrijk vonden van nee, weet je, we, dit zijn gewoon de vier beste die we hadden van alle aanmeldingen. En wat is iets van oké, okay, de nummer vier willen we een aanmoedigingsprijs geven. En die aanmoedigingsprijs houdt in een één op één masterclass workshop van mij. Um, 
En dan mag je met hem van het lijf vragen. En dan ga ik je helpen en dan gooi ik helemaal mijn netwerk open en dan gaan we aan de slag. Dat sowieso. Um, dat gezegd te hebben, ik ga het niet uit mijn hoofd doen. Ik heb wel het juryrapport bij me, het zat de hele tijd warm in mijn broekzak. Terwijl ik met jullie sprak, zat het gewoon hier. Het was warm, het was dichtbij. En we gaan beginnen met de nummer drie. En als ik je naam noem, als ik je naar voren roep, dan krijg je alvast een bundel. En de rest ontvang je later. Ontvang je later, ontvang je later. Ja. Oké. Okay. Um, de jury zei bij de nummer drie dat het ritmisch was van het begin tot het eind. Dat er misschien wel een jonge nieuwe king schuilt in deze persoon. En de jury wil nog veel meer horen van deze persoon. Kom naar voren. Myron Humming. Top, top. Heel nice, heel nice. En uh, ik moet zeggen, en dat vind ik ook, ik wil dat er gewoon erbij vermelden, weet je, kijk. Sowieso vind ik het tof dat we video's konden bekijken. Dat het niet als bij een normale poëziewedstrijd gaat, dat je dan teksten gaat lezen alleen en we hebben video's bekeken. Maar je merkt wel het verschil van live, hoe het live overkomt. Dus iedereen die hier aanwezig is, die heeft het gevoeld. En uh, ik ben trots. Ik ben super trots. Nummer twee. Een hele sterke performance. De video voelde al af. Er werd een directe link gemaakt met Amerika. Maar het bleef hier. Diep gaan met een extra dimensie. Kom naar voren. Karim en Luta. Het is denk ik wel belangrijk dat ik ook wel vermeld, uh, was ik bijna vergeten te zeggen, van waar de jury op heeft gelet. Weet je, kijk, een performance, een goede performance bestaat niet alleen maar uit performen, het moet ook ergens over gaan. Maar tegelijkertijd, wat er natuurlijk een Martin Luther King wedstrijd is, uh, Spoken Word wedstrijd is, hebben we ook gekeken van oké, okay, uh, we cannot walk alone, waar gaat het over? Gaat het over daar, gaat het over hier, kunnen we die link leggen met hier? Dus we hebben bewust gelet op... Uh, um, de link met Nederland, het persoonlijke, wat laat je van jezelf zien, vandaag de dag. Vandaag de dag, 2020. Dus daar hebben we specifiek op gelet. Uh, en uiteraard de performance. Ik ga de nummer 1 opnoemen en dan is het ook bekend wie de aanmoedigingsprijs krijgt. Dit is spannend, het is zou ik willen tikken hier, maar het mag niet. Het mag niet, maar we kunnen wel gewoon zo doen. De nummer 1 is sowieso een vrouw. <laughs> een geweldige performer, een veelzijdige artiest, met heel, heel erg persoonlijk en herkenbaar en geloofwaardig. Uh, iemand die voor haar leeftijd al heel erg geloofwaardig is, een jonge rolmodel, waarbij er hoop is voor de toekomst. Kom naar voren, Amare van der Elst. Ik zou me bijna een brasa geven volgens mij, maar mag niet. Mag niet. <laughs> yes. Ik, ik, vind, ik vind het zo moeilijk, want persoonlijk, persoonlijk hou ik niet zo van wedstrijden. Want dan ga je ineens. Want hoe ga je. Het is bijna alsof je appels met peren moet gaan vergelijken. Dus we moeten heel streng moeten we gaan hakken. En wat is iets van. Als je we vonden jou zo geweldig. Wat is iets van. No, we gaan daar niet zonder iets wegsturen. Dus we hebben die prijs speciaal erbij geroepen om jou erbij te houden. Want we zien nog veel meer aan jou. En ik wil aan jou meegeven van. Um, wat, ik, wat, ik, wat ik miste. En dat moet je zien als iets positiefs. Was van. Volgens mij heb jij niet volledig jezelf laten zien in een stuk. En heb je echt die Martin Luther King stukkant echt fantastisch gedaan. Maar we waren benieuwd naar jou. Dus daar gaan we aan werken. Dus kom naar voren. Ik ben sowieso van de, ik zal iedereen naar Brazen geven. Maar we cannot do that. Alhoewel ik wel immuun ben. Ik heb al gehad. I'm safe. Everybody safe. Um, ja. Dit was het. Nogmaals een warm applaus voor alle deelnemers, voor iedereen die heeft meegedaan. Uh, trouwens, alle mensen die hebben deelgenomen, als ze meekijken, ze ontvangen ook allemaal een lockdown bundel die niet verkrijgbaar is. Just saying. All right. Dankjewel Elton. Dankjewel. Alle die hebben deelgenomen, ook zij die misschien nu nog thuis zitten, maar die hun spoken word hebben opgestuurd. Ik ga switchen naar het Engels omdat we nog steeds Dr. West Bellamy met ons hebben en anderen die internationaal meekijken met ons. I just mentioned that 
I'm really grateful and thankful for all the participants, those who have contributed with their spoken word. And basically, we just heard the head of the jury, and I again want to thank the jury for their hard work, so thank you, Dominica, Hella, Shanika, and Elton, because as I was here hearing all of them, I could definitely see how hard it was for you to pick those top three, now a top four. So before we go to Elton Kina with his special, specially written spoken word, I want to thank you all at home. And I also want to thank the organizations, those who contributed, Justice and Peace, of course, the Martin Luther King Lecture Foundation, Student Association Tribes, the Hague University of Applied Sciences, VU, and so many more who have helped us to make sure that you at home and we here in this place could have had this amazing event. I also want to ask you, for those who are online, you can see that in these times, money is needed. We need money. The fact that we're giving it away doesn't mean that we have it plenty. No, unfortunately not. So, for those who are willing to support us, please make sure that you contribute. It can be something small, it can be something big, it can be something symbolic maybe for you. It can be something that you want to give just for the sake of you making sure that you show how much you trust in the fight that we're fighting. So, if you're seeing us on the Crowdcast, you can see that you have the Ask the Question button, then you have the Donate button, and then you have People. So, there's a button on the right below which you can push and then you can just do whatever you like yeah all right without further ado this was a little warming up please a round of applause for elton kina who can i on this Hoe kan ik meer? Hoe kan ik meer doen in een wereld die constant verandert? Wat kan ik veranderen? Hoe kan ik weer? Hoe kan ik elke keer weer de kracht vinden om anders te handelen, om beter te handelen? Om niet alleen voor mezelf te veranderen, maar ook voor de wereld waarin ik leef en daarbuiten, onder andere. Hoe kan ik van waarde zijn? Inmiddels weet ik hoe ik van waarde kan zijn. Het begint bij dankbaarheid en erkennen. Ik ben al. En iedereen is al. We zijn hier nu nog steeds. We zijn alleen niet altijd bewust van alle invloed die we bezitten. Ook als individu. Nog steeds. Het zit hem vaak in de houding die we aannemen. En hoe we ruimte innemen. Hoe we ruimte moeten geven om mee te kunnen bewegen in deze tijd waarin we leven in onze samenleving. Ik herinner mezelf dagelijks aan het feit dat er nog nooit zoveel mogelijk is geweest als vandaag de dag. Nog nooit zoveel mogelijkheden. Nog nooit zoveel awareness wereldwijd. Nog nooit voerden we samen zoveel strijd met zoveel mensen tegelijkertijd. Maar het is niet genoeg. Ik weet het. Iedereen weet het. Het is een rare tijd. En ik weet het, niet alles is slecht. Er is gelukkig, maar één, er is gelukkig meer dan één waarheid. Er is meer. En dat geeft me kracht. Het geeft hoop. We kunnen zoveel beter. We kunnen zoveel meer geven. En weet je, praten is makkelijk. Woorden hebben minder waarde als ze niet resoneren. Dus laten we beginnen bij het begin met woorden. En woorden. En het zin geven. Eerlijk. Vaak hebben we het over verwachtingen, over eigen verwachtingen, over verwachtingen van de wereld, over verwachtingen van de mensen om ons heen. En het zet me regelmatig aan het denken over wat kan ik zelf, hoe kan ik zelf. Ubuntu. Ik ben omdat wij zijn. En als ik daaraan denk voel ik me vrij. Alleen samen kunnen we anders voor elkaar. Want we zijn allemaal schakels in dezelfde ketting. We moeten elkaar dragen. Elke schakel in de ketting heeft waarde. Waarde. Tenminste, als je het wilt geloven. Wij samen hebben het vermogen om te kunnen kiezen voor waarheden waar meer mensen baat bij hebben. Laten we vaker een extra stap zetten. Laten we vaker de vraag stellen van, hoe kan ik anders? Hoe kan ik meer? Hoe kan ik meer in een wereld die constant verandert? Wat kan ik veranderen? Voor beter. Eén ding is zeker. Alleen. Samen. Wow. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. 
I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have done. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for all those who are here around me and you back home. We are very much looking forward to seeing you the next time that we will have our Martin Luther King Lecture. My name is Maria Toko, and today I was your moderator. Have a blessed evening.